we're going to look at two passages uh, first from chapter 13 of Romans chapter 13 and then chapter 6 from 1 Corinthians so would you open both passages Romans chapter 13 verse 11 through 14 then 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12 through 18 then chapter 7 verse 1 and 7 through 10 here is the word of God besides this you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed the night is far gone the day is at hand so then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of the light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in the orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 all things are lawful for you, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then? Take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute, never. Or do you not know that he who joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For, as it is written, the two will become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have a sexual relations with the woman. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of his own kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widowed I say it is good for them to remain as single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with a passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. The word of God. Verse 11 says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. In this passage, Apostle Paul contrasts between secular hopelessness and Christian hope. I want us to meditate three points from today's passage. First, Difference between secular and Christian views on sex, romantic love, singleness, and marriage. Second, the root of Christian view. Third, practical applications for single and married people. First, difference between secular and Christian views on sex, romantic love, and singleness and marriage. Second, the root of Christian view. Third, practical applications for single and married people. First, difference between secular and Christian view of sex, romantic love, and singleness and marriage. What sets Christianity apart from all other moral and ethical belief systems, all other philosophies and religions in the world? Only Christians believe the best is yet to come because of certainty of Jesus' return. Certainty of Jesus' return shapes every aspect of life. 
certainty of Jesus' return shapes a Christian to live radically different from unbelievers. As an example, I know a man who immigrated to the United States for one purpose, making a lot of money. Well, he did not believe in God, but he believed in money. And he made a lot of money. And he has two expensive houses, one in Queens and one in Long Island, drives expensive cars. The other day, his wife told me and my wife that she was very concerned of her husband. He began to develop a drinking problem and he throws up frequently from excessive drinking. Do you see what is going on? Pursuit of making a lot of money was like an airplane ascending. Now he is at the age when he must descend. He placed his deepest hope in money and he believed in money, but his heart is empty. Emptiness of material possession and futility of life are becoming too difficult to accept. Certainty of past and his future has driven him to alcohol. Certainty of pessimistic future was shaping every aspect of his life. Apostle Paul says, You know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. He contrasts Christian hope to unbelievers' hopelessness. Christian hope is certainty of Jesus' return in glory and the believer's final redemption. Certainty of glorious future determines every aspect of Christian life. Waiting for Jesus' return is not passive. It is an active pur purifying of our lives in the pursuit of holiness and readiness for our lives for our Lord. 1 John 3, 3 says, And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. Now, Apostle Paul places area of sex in the context of Christian hope of Jesus' return. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality. Christian hope affects the way in which we face not only death, but also sex, romance, singleness, and marriage. Christian view on sex, singleness, and marriage is shaped by certainty of Jesus' return. Certainty of glorious future frees a Christian from idolizing sex, romance, and singleness and marriage. I want to make contrast between the first century view of sex, singleness, and marriage to Christian view. In 1 Corinthians 6.13, Apostle Paul mentions two current few two current views on sex in the first century food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food first view said food and sex are parallel you eat when you're hungry and likewise you have sex when you have sexual appetite. If you need to have sex, you have sex. One should feel free to fulfill the sexual appetite when one feels the need. Second view is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. It is good for a man not to have a sexual relations with woman. 
this view is almost the opposite of first view. This view arose from the Greek understanding the material and body are temporal and importing is spiritual matter. Therefore, a holy person should abstain from bodily things such as sex. Sex is degrading, dirty, and defiling except for necessity of procreation. You notice that these two views are also dominant today. One view says sex is appetite. If you need to have sex, you have sex, just like you eat when you are hungry. The other view says sex is dirty. Sex is not something to be talked about in church or in public because sex is dirty or sinful. There is a third view today, which is a little variation that idolize sex, that sees sex as a critical form of self-expression. It is a way to be yourself and find yourself. Sex is primary for individual's fulfillment of self-realization. Now, against these secular views, Christianity gives revolutionary view. view. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16 says, for as, for as it is written, the two will become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Apostle Paul is quoting Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It is God who created marriage and sex. And God meant sex to be celebrated in marriage only. Hold fast in Genesis chapter 2 is, is to make a covenant. Wedding ceremony is two people making covenant before God. Marriage is a union between two people becoming a single person. When God said, and they shall become one flesh. That's much more than physical union. To merge into single unit in entire aspects. Marriage is two people becoming one socially, legally, economically, psychologically, in every way possible. To become one, sharing everything. One life, one reputation, one bed, one joy one suffering, one budget, one family, one mission. Therefore, sex in marriage is giving of self to the other, socially, legally, economically, psychologically, philosophically, in every way possible. God invented sex in marriage so that two people in marriage would be committed to one another. Sex is an expression of giving entire self to the other. Sex is commitment of all of you to the other. Every sex mirrors this union of entire being of two people becoming one in marriage. If sex is an act of covenant renewal. God did not invent sex for self-gratification or self-fulfillment. Sex is self-donation, giving of self to the other in marriage. Sex is commitment of self to the other. It is confirmation of entirety of two becoming one transformation. The Bible says you should never have a physical oneness with a whole life oneness. One should never get physically naked and vulnerable with someone without becoming vulnerable in your whole life. That's why Apostle Paul is prohibiting sex outside marriage in verse 18. 
It doesn't say, do not commit adultery. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Do you see Paul's argument? Can a Christian have sex with a prostitute and become one with a prostitute without giving entire self to prostitute? Is it possible to give your body without giving your whole life to the other? When you have sex outside the marriage, you are abusing, you are dishonoring, you are actually destroying this incredible person-shaping commitment mechanism of deep soul nurture and personal transformation that God gave you in marriage. Christianity gave the revolutionary view of sex against the first century Roman ethic. According to the first century Roman ethic, a man displayed his masculinity in battlefield and bedroom dominance. A married man has sex outside marriage to display this dominance which the society accepted as norm. And Christianity said no. In the Christian ethic, a husband displayed his masculinity in chastity, in self-sacrifice, in deference to the others, in joyfully refraining from all sexual activity except with his wife. Here's ancient writing of early Christian sexual life that was different from Roman Empire culture. Quote, they, Christians, marry as do others. They beget children, but they do not destroy their offspring. They have a common table, but not a common bed. They have a common table, but not a common bed. This was revolutionary at the time. Now, not only Christian view of sex is radically different from secular view, Christian view of singleness and marriage is radically different. Let's turn to verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 6. I think that in view of present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from wife? Do not seek wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if, if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have a worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This passage says to single Christian, if you are single, you can live perfectly fulfilling Christian life as single. Don't be too eager to get married because a marriage is a lot of headache. This also says to married people, are you married? Great. Now don't try to be single. Whether you are single or married, don't be too eager to change your status. This was a revolutionary view of singleness and marriage when you understand the traditional view of first century. At the time, there was no individual honor, success, or achievement. There was only family honor, family success, family achievement. There was no individual significance apart from family. There was no future apart from family. There was no security apart from family. At that time, most wives were encouraged to remarry after either the death of the husband or divorce. There was an even legislation passed 
during the rule of Augustus that required widows and widowers to remarry to be able to fully inherit from the people outside the immediate family. Now, against this secular view, Christianity says it is perfectly okay to be single. Now, I have to differentiate Christian view of singleness from modern view of singleness. What is modern view of singleness? We live in a society that says, if you don't find true love, you cannot possibly be satisfied. Find your soulmate, perfect love of your life. If you do not have sex, romance, and love, you cannot possibly be satisfied. The society idolizes sex, romance, and marriage. People place sex, romance, and marriage in place of God. People have sex in order to have what only God can give. People expect romantic love and marriage to give what only God can give. People want significance, higher meaning in life from sex, romance, and marriage. Why? In reality, many modern men live as if there is no God. They look to love partner sex and marriage in place of God. They want self-justification, self-affirmation, self-glorification from love partner. They want to get rid of nothingness through romantic relationship. What do I mean? They say, if that incredible person approves me, if that in incredible person accepts me, then I know I am okay. If that incredible person says, I am great, then I am great. People look to love partner to get rid of false guilt and feeling of nothingness. Do you see incredible burden on love partner? No romantic love, no sex, no relationship can give what only God can give. Some placed all eggs in the basket of love partner. And any sign of rejection by love partner is interpreted as denial of self-justification, self-affirmation, and self-glorification. A secular psychologist, Ernest Becker, said this, quote, Failure of romantic love as a solution to human problem is so much a part of modern man's frustration. No human relationship can bear the burden of Godhood. However much we may idealize and idealize and idolize him, the law partner, he inevitably reflects earthly decay and imperfection. After all, what is it that we want when we elevate the love partner to this position? We want our faults, of our feeling of nothingness. We want to be justified. We know to know our existence has not been in vain. We want redemption, nothing less. Needless to say, human partners cannot give this. Unquote. Traditional view says, unless you have family, you are not legitimate. Modern view says, unless you have romance, sex, and love, you cannot be fulfilled. But Christianity says no to both traditional view and modern view. What is the root of such radical Christian view? Second, the root of Christian view. What does the Bible say? Let's go back to Romans chapter 13. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. 
Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, but in quarreling and not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify his desires. Apostle Paul contrasts Christian hope to unbelievers' hopelessness. Christian hope is certainty of Jesus' return in glory and believers' final redemption. In the first century, a society, a, go a society governed by the sun rather than by the convenience of electricity. People rose at dawn in the first century. People worked under the sunlight. The time is Jesus' return. Christians live under the sunlight. They live with the certainty of Jesus' return. Every day, Jesus' return is a day nearer. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Certainty of pasmic future determines every aspect of unbelievers' life. But certainty of glorious future determines every aspect of Christian life. Our present behavior, our present living are shaped by what we believe our ultimate future to be. We have life-shaping certainty of Jesus' return. And we look at sex, singleness, and marriage through the glass of Jesus' return. Christian hope affects the way in which we face death, trouble, money, sex, singleness, and marriage. Certainty of glorious future frees a Christian from idolizing sex, singleness, and marriage. Third, practical applications for single and married people. Sex, romance, and marriage is deemed reflection of our union with Jesus when, we, when He returns. When you are single or married, Christians live with a full taste of ultimate union with Jesus. What we have here is only a full taste. We live with a full taste of future glory here on earth, but that's not complete. Human marriage reflects the marriage God wants you to enjoy with His people forever. The people speaks of Jesus, the Bible speaks of Jesus as the bridegroom who will one day return to take his bride, the church, to be with his, him in the perfect new creation. On that day, all pain will disappear, including the pain of difficult marriage or singleness. God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and great shout will be heard. Revelation chapter 9, 10, 7. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Christians live with the certainty of union with the ultimate lover. We will experience ultimate intimacy with the ultimate lover. We are a part of God's glorious family. We live with the certainty of the ultimate family, the ultimate family that will truly satisfy our hearts. Certainty of glorious future frees a Christian from idolizing singleness and marriage. To the degree you have a certainty of glorious future, to that degree you hope your hope in Jesus determines how you view sex, singleness, and marriage. So if you are single, 
develop fulfilling love relationship with Jesus. Whatever you, your experience of singleness, recognize it as a gift from God and make the most of it for as long as you have it. Singleness, like marriage, is a God-given calling, not an identity. You are loved, valued, forgiven, accepted on purpose, and empowered in Christ. You are not less of a child of God in the singleness. Jesus was single. Apostle Paul was single. You are not less important in the kingdom. Your service is not needed any less. No matter what others may say or you may think, you are not inferior, less holy or less valuable. You are a child of the Holy Father, Heavenly Father, and you are united to the bridegroom, and your Heavenly Father cares for you. In John chapter 4, Jesus meets a woman who placed her deepest hope in man. She had pursued romantic love, sex, and marriage, but her heart was empty. She says, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Jesus told her that she can never quench thirst no matter how much she tries in romantic love and sex and remarriage. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came to be her living water. Jesus came to be her ultimate lover. Jesus told her, I am your true lover and make me your ultimate lover. She needed to believe Jesus and place her deepest hope in Jesus. Jesus says to you, whether you're single or married, Jesus is a true lover that you really need. If you are single, remember, no Christian is single forever. Develop fulfilling love relationship with Jesus. If you're single, and if you pursue ma marriage, but if you do not have a deeply fulfilling love relationship with Jesus, then you will place unbearable burden on your spouse. If you are married, develop fulfilling love relationship with Jesus. If you are happily married, you need to have Jesus as your true lover so that you do not make an idol out of your spouse and become too dependent on your spouse. If you are unhappily married, you need Jesus as your one true lover or you'll be too despondent and too much in despair. As a summary then, in view of Jesus' return, in view of this glorious hope that we have in Jesus, develop fulfilling love relationship with Jesus. Amen. Church, thank you for joining us for worship again on this Sunday. Uh, before we end, we'll close in prayer, so we may bow our heads. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you again for this time of worship. We thank you for um, just new mercies today, um, breathing life into us, and just another day in, um, in which we can just uh, bring you glory, um, bring you honor, bring you worship to the King who is greater than all. Uh, Father God, we just pray that um, throughout this week, um, as this week comes, Father, may we find ourselves uh, just looking to the cross. Uh, may we find ourselves uh, yearning for you. Find ourselves um, just spending time in your presence, God. Um, Father, may we want to be nowhere else um, 
but where you are. Father, may our hearts find rest and just peace. Just in you, in who you are, in your presence, God. Father, we just ask um, for your continuous love again now. Uh, your grace that this week, Father God, um, we continue to lean on. Um, just a loving Father, um, a gracious God. Father, we always thank you so much for just who you are. Um, Father, no amount of words, no amount of worship, no amount of praise can ever amount um, to your greatness and how grateful we should be. Father, God, may we um, live our lives for you. Hey, Father, we just thank you again so much for this time of worship, and we love you. We give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. And we give you all the praise. In your son's precious name we pray.